Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jacob Putney. I am an OSU Extension Forester for Baker and Grant Counties. Uh, it is my pleasure to be your host for today's Tree School online webinar. Uh, with me today is Norma Klein, OSU Extension Forester for Coos and Curry Counties, who's going to be monitoring the chat. Uh, Tree School Online is a production of the OSU Forestry and Natural Resources Extension Program and the Partnership for Forestry Education. We want to give special recognition to the Oregon Forest Resource Institute for leading this project and to the US Forest Service and the Oregon Department of Forestry for giving us a grant to cover our expenses. Tree School Online webinars are offered every first and third Tuesday of the month through June 2021. Please visit the Tree School Online page on the knowyourforest.org website for updates. Uh, got a couple of housekeeping details to go through. Uh, the Zoom toolbar should be located at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, scroll your cursor over this area and it should pop up. Uh, on some hardware such as iPads, the Zoom toolbar is on the top of the display. Um, many of the features today can be accessed from this toolbar. Uh, audio, audio is muted for participants and video is not available for participants as well. Written questions should be posted in the Q&A box. The Q&A box can be found on that Zoom toolbar. Uh, I will be monitoring this throughout the webinar. We are asking that all of your questions for our presenters be written in the Q&A box. Uh, we're not able to take any spoken questions. Uh, should, or the chat should only be used if you're having problems. Uh, this will be monitored throughout the webinar. Um, we ask that you don't post any questions in the chat, but in the Q&A box. Uh, chat can also be used to send messages to panelists and participants, either individually or as a group. Resources for the webinar can be found on the Tree School Online Class Guide page, which you can easily reach from the Tree School Online page at knowyourforest.org. Click on the webinar description, then look for the webinar you are looking for. Um, immediately above each webinar description is a link to the instructor resources. Webinars are being recorded. They will be archived as YouTube videos and be accessible from the Tree School Online web pages. Uh, polls. So there are going to be two polls during this webinar, one at the beginning and one at the end. Polls should pop up on your screen in a box. After you answer the questions, the poll can be closed. If you don't see the polls, check in the Zoom toolbar for a lighted button. If the button appears, the poll should pop up when you press it. And finally, if you'd like to receive continuing education credits for Oregon professional loggers, go to knowyourforest.org and request forms can be found under the resources section. And with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers today. Uh, Amanda Rao is the Regional Fire Specialist for the Willamette Valley and Cascades with the OSU Extension Fire Program. Glenn Ahrens is the OSU Extension Forester for Clackamas, Marion, and Hood River Counties. And Brad Withrow Robinson is the OSU Extension Forester for Benton, Lynn, and Polk Counties. And with that, I will let the speakers take over. Thanks, Jacob. Uh, my name's Amanda Rao. Can you all hear me okay? Going well? Okay, great. Um, first, before I launch into my presentation, um, I just want to tell you a little more about myself. Um, I started my career in fire management in 1999, uh, working for a contract hand crew based uh, in Springfield, Oregon. And from that point, I knew that I really wanted to do fire, but I had an undergraduate in philosophy, which didn't help me out much. So I ended up going back to school at Oregon State to do my post back, and then followed up with a master's in natural resources at the University of Idaho with an emphasis in fire ecology and management. I worked for the for US Forest Service for about 14 years before I went to work for the Nature Conservancy where I managed their fire program in Oregon and Washington. Uh, during my time with the Forest Service, I really cut my teeth in fire management and um, learned to become a burn boss, which I really put to use once I joined the Nature Conservancy. Uh, most of my early career was spent in suppression and then I switched over to fuels management focusing on prescribed fire. Um, after working for TNC for uh, about five years, um, I had the opportunity to accept the position that I'm in now, and here I am getting to teach about a lot of the things that I've had the pleasure of doing in my work. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and launch into my presentation. Hopefully. Yeah, it's a little slow. We're going backwards now. Okay. <laughs> 
Uh, technical difficulties here for a moment, folks. Just give me one moment. I'm going to stop sharing. I'll be right back. While you pull that up, Amanda, I am going to launch the first poll. And this poll is just to get to know the audience a little bit better and where you're from, about yourself, and how many acres of forest. <clears throat> So I will launch this and I'll keep that open about a minute. It should pop up on your screen. Okay, trying this again. While you guys are taking the poll, I am gonna actually begin my presentation now. Thanks for your patience. Now hopefully it will continue to work with me here. All right. So I wanted to start off with a little bit of discussion on why we manage forest with fire in mind. And at the top of my list is creating safe places for firefighters to work. I mentioned that specifically because I think that we tend to uh, view firefighters as people who come to save us when things are not going well when it comes to fire. And they're often performing heroic acts uh, in doing so. And so we have the opportunity to help them by preparing places where they're gonna work in advance. So I really wanna make sure that's a point that um, I make here, because I think we forget that sometimes. I, we remember it when fire season's really bad and we worry about folks out on the line, um, but we have a lot, of, uh, a lot we can do to help them in advance. Um, we also manage forests with fire in mind to protect our homes. That seems like a pretty um, no-brainer answer, but plenty of us don't necessarily have homes on forests that we manage, so it's not always a consideration. Um, of course, conserving natural resources and wildlife habitat, um, they can benefit from fire and they can also be harmed by fire, and it depends on what kind they receive. Um, but we definitely consider those resources and values um, when we're managing our forests. Um, being mindful about fire. And then perhaps I think what I hear is something that folks are really concerned about on the west side after the fires of Labor Day is how we retain our investments in the future harvest of timber that we've been working so hard to plant and maintain. So how do we maintain that investment um, in this rapidly changing fire environment? So this slide is not meant to guide too much of our conversation today. It's really just to point out that when we look at these defensible space graphics, and there's many of them, and we're thinking about the kinds of events that we just experienced that were really historic, the focal area should be in that five foot zone and out to 30 feet. I'm not saying we should have everything 30 feet around a house completely scarified, but we should always, always, always be prepared for these historically rare wildfire events. Um, at least during the fire season, the part of fire season that we're concerned about, which is usually in the fall, um, when east winds kick up and fuels are really dry and receptive. That tends to be on the west side, especially the time when we need to worry. Um, so I'm not saying you need to worry about that now as the rain is falling, but to be worried to the point that you do something um, in preparation for the inevitable. But what do we do beyond that 30 foot zone? How much do we remove and what? We're not gonna give you the answers necessarily, but we're gonna really focus on trade-offs and thought processes and how to consider um, the different ways in which fire interacts with the environments across the state of Oregon. But I put this at the front just in case we lose people, because if there's any point that I'd like to drive home today, it would be do everything you can to remove combustible material within that five foot zone around your house and take it out to 30 feet if you can. And then really thinking about if I cleared brush and um, needles and leaves from around my house, is that still uh, effective three months later or did more material collect in that time frame? So really revisiting your work and making sure that it's still sound. But even more so, if you have irrigation, um, really considering maintaining that because I think that can make a huge difference. So just to get that public service message out of the way, we'll move now into the meat of the presentation. I decided to include this slide because I think it really explains well how we relate between, how, what the relationship between a single flame 
and what we would consider a super fire regime. What, how does that relate? Um, a flame is just a component of three things, oxygen, heat, and some kind of fuel. Um, when we have an event that involves a fire, that's many different flames, then we have weather topography and fuel at play. But once we get up into the fire regime, we're talking about climate variability, mean, um, regional controls and topography, and vegetation. I'm not going to get too much into the super fire regime, I've, although I will refer to it a bit. Um, you know, the past is important for us to consider, but we also are moving into an unprecedented future. So the degree to which we refer to the past has more to do with how um, we consider as a baseline moving forward into the future, as opposed to the way things will be in the future, if that makes sense. So speaking of climate, I think it's important to point out that we're in a warm, dry climate period and in, in a period when fire is increasing. And that is on the heels of a time frame during which the Pacific Decadal Oscillation aborted cool, wet climactic conditions that aided in uh, effective fire suppression. Um, I think a lot of us, myself included, who came in, you know, here kind of uh, at the very beginning of this warm, um, dry climate period, just thought there had been a lot of success on the landscape with fire suppression. But if we look back to the last warm, dry climactic period, um, during the early part of the last century, it wasn't that different from what we're experiencing now, although we are seeing higher temperatures now than what we saw during that period. But that's when the fire suppression era really took hold in the United States. It was following the fires of 1910, the Big Burn, as it's called in um, the Northern Rockies. So that period coincided with an aggressive fire suppression policy as well as a cool, wet period of active fire suppression. So here we now, here we are now with all that fire suppression background, moving into a period where things are drying and warming again. And we need to consider that in our strategies and the ways in which we think about fire in our forests. This slide shows uh, Oregon's largest wildfires over uh, 50,000 acres. Um, some of this is actual uh, mapped fire line. And some of it is data that has been extrapolated um, and theorized from information from timeframes during which we didn't have um, the kind of data collecting um, mechanisms that we have today. So the Millicoma fire of 1765, for example, the extent is assumed, but it's not known exactly. Um, but fire history studies and research have helped us to at least identify these large fires. And so even Beachy Creek, which um, is now uh, the 12th largest wildfire in Oregon's history, it's still only number 12, meaning we had a lot bigger fires prior to that point. Now that begs the question, is that just because they weren't being suppressed um, or is it because we're heading towards more of that? It's hard to say, but it's important to think in the context of time um, and this, in this case, hundreds of years of time, um, as far as what we just experienced. We've got Beachy Creek, of course, is the 12th, and then Lion's Head number 14, uh, Holiday Farms number 17, Riverside number 20, Archie Creek number 22. So we did just log a fair number of fires, and those are in the top, I believe those are in the, the top 25. Um, so I'd say if we if this pattern continues, then perhaps uh, modern era fires will start to to trump those that happened in the past. Um, but the take home here is really that you know we hear a lot about the mega fires and how we're seeing unprecedented wildfire, and I would argue um, perhaps that's not true. But we may see unprecedented fire, wildfire moving into the future because we're going to have the alignment of this um, climate um, model or the the Pacific Decadal Oscillation those cooler, wetter periods um, alternate with drier periods, as well as climate change, as well as fuels um, accumulating that need to burn. So the, the future is not yet known. We'll see what happens, um, but just to keep it kind of in context. Um, the next slide shows two different things. Um, it's the same place though. So the left-hand side is the Oregon coast. The right-hand side is the Willamette Valley. North end is around Portland and south end would be um, south end of the Willamette Valley. And um, the left-hand slide shows the different kinds of um, 
ecotypes that we could um, expect to have seen at that time. Things have changed a lot since then, but um, based on some of the research that's been done, uh, evaluating general land office surveys and such, we know that there was a lot of oak savanna and upland prairies in the Willamette Valley, um, wetland prairies and tidelands. There were oak woodlands that had other species as well. Um, of course, a lot of Douglas fir, uh, forest land and thick spruce, lodgepole pine, hemlock, and cedar. And but what's really interesting here, aside from all of those different vegetation types, is how much fire there was between the late 18th and early 20th centuries. Most of the coast range has experienced some kind of fire in those time frames. So again, there's been fire in these places, um, and we should expect to see it in the future. And then I, I wanted to point out on the right side that um, there are a lot of um, peoples from tribes and um, indigenous groups who had an influence on um, fire, both by causing it in uh, ways that were intended for um, cultural purposes, as well as unintended. So um, not necessarily putting out campfires, just really living with fire as opposed to living in opposition to fire. And so that probably, I would, I would argue there is a relationship between the, the human beings who are on the landscape um, since time immemorial prior, prior to colonization, living with fire, having more fire in the environment. Um, this slide is intended to um, account for a little bit of a gap in a, another slide I'm about to show. So I, I'm really just wanting to show you what the Willamette Valley looks like. Um, this is that vegetation condition, which is directly related to fire. Um, you see alignment with um, fire return intervals, and that meaning how often a fire can be expected to burn in a particular location and vegetation type. So wet and upland prairie and savanna are on a six to 15 year return interval. Oak woodland should see fire on the average of every 21 to 40 years. And then riparian and conifer forests on that huge range of 71 to 1,000 years. So just in our Willamette Valley area, we have um, anywhere from return intervals, this is based on land fire data. I would argue now that the return interval is actually more frequent in wet and upland prairie, maybe closer to one, two or three years. But regardless, we have a, basically a thousand year spread of what we can expect in the Willamette Valley, incredibly diverse place. But let's tell a more simple story and then move into the differences between the west side and the east side. And you will see that I tend to the west side here more, and there's good reason for that. Um, the dry side, east side story has been told quite a bit already, and there's a lot of work done in those landscapes um, to mitigate fire hazard. But on the west side of the Cascades, um, we don't think of fire as being in our backyard that often, and so we take a different approach. So we're going to try to tussle with some of the complexities of the west side in this presentation while also um, nodding to the east side and what we know about what happens there. So this map here shows um, the Pacific Northwest and fire regime groups. Um, I was asked to explain why number two is not there. It's because that fire regime applies to um, like chaparral and such that, bur that is meant to burn on a, a rotation where it completely is replaced and then it all grows back again. Um, and we don't really have that in the Pacific Northwest, but what we do have is under fire regime group one, that's the zero to 35 year frequency, low to mixed severity. Um, now to, to, to be clear, severity has to do with the impacts of the fire, not how intensely it burns, but how does it affect the vegetation? And um, so we see that a lot of Oregon and Washington are in that um, fire regime one group, uh, frequent low intensity fire. Moving into fire regime group three, we see that that's a, that's a mixed bag. Um, it can, fire return can be every 35 years, all the way up to 200 years, uh, generally considered to be mixed and low severity, but it can also include some high severity fires. And there is interface between those high severity fires and mixed and low severity fires. And then we see that that happens in the higher elevations where we get um, even more diversity of mixed conifer. So that's where the interface between fire regime three and four is. And then five, which covers the coast range, is um, replacement of any severity that, it, that um, occurs every 200 or, or more years. And these are all very general. And, um, and, and indeed, the uh, fire regime group three on the west side used to be a standard placement regime, and they changed it. 
because they realize that that low and mixed severity fires and they meaning scientists and those who research and study these things determined that the west side is actually um, more appropriately considered to be into that um, mixed and low severity regime. So now I'm going to go into the story of the natural rule of fire and dry forests. Um, it's a pretty straightforward story, as I've about, as I've said, and I think it's been told a lot, but we need to we need to tend to that here. So we're going to start off with a stand. These are based on uh, graphics by Van Pelt, and um, he's done a lovely job of um, animating this stuff for us. And so we've got um, year zero. So this is the beginning, but it's not because obviously trees have grown up there. But this is in a setting where we're talking about that high frequency, low severity fire return. We get year 20 and we get a low severity burn, but it does end up having some impacts on that little clump in the middle. So we'll see what happens to that. Oh, it looks like the clump is gone. Okay, but there's another one growing up here. Great. And then, oh, that clump burned up this time and this one did too. So maybe that's just going to keep being an opening at year 60. And then here we are at year 80. So year 80 and year zero don't actually look that different. And that's the whole point. Um, the change agent is frequent, low severity, maintains that um, more stable overstory. So what happens if we don't um, allow fire to do its work there? Well, we'll end up with this. And this is really what most of the work on the east side of the Cascades is tending to. It's tending to um, all of these overstocked stands that are used to having their stand densities reduced on regular intervals um, with frequent fire. And this is a really simple pattern of low intensity over regular intervals or at regular intervals over space and time. It's an easily told story. And it makes it a lot easier to um, address. Well, I shouldn't say a lot easier. We still have challenges with getting enough good uh, mechanical work done and, and fire on the ground um, of the type that these stands really need. Um, but at least the problem is, is relatively simple. And so we can say we, th we need to thin, pile, mow, burn, all those things in these dry um, systems that are limited in precipitation are, are generally acceptable. Well, the west side is a different story. And unfortunately, Van Pelt did not create graphics for me. So I had to take this graphic by Franklin um, et al. from 2017, explaining the common successional pathways following disturbance in moist Douglas fir forests and add all of my own um, interpretations to that. So we start off year zero with a standard placement fire. So these are all snags, they're all dead. And um, these are all trees that are gonna start growing up. Well, maybe we had a low severity wildfire there in the beginning. Maybe we had more of that as time went on. Um, but eventually we have a very mature stand, uh, fully stocked and frankly, ready to burn. Um, maybe it's ready to burn you know, closer down to here. But in the absence of fire, it will continue to mature as such. Um, but when, if you just take all of this fire out, then you know this isn't that complicated. But when you include the fire piece, it makes it really challenging um, to explain what to do in response and how to mitigate um, undesirable impacts from wildfire. So this I call a complex pattern of varying intensity, extent, and frequency over time. And then this also kind of explains that Douglas fir establishment on the west side has historically been regionally episodic um, and it's been directly related to wildfire because Douglas fir loves um, growing in places where fires have burned. It is not at all tolerant of shade. And so when all the shade's been removed, it um, tends to be a good colonizing species um, in wildfire areas and other disturbed areas, but particularly wildfire. And so what this is telling us is that with warm, dry climate periods and more fire, um, we see um, more establishment of Douglas fir. So now we got to really talk about what does this all mean when you're not talking about a, a, a mature old stand that's not being managed for harvest or revenue. Um, and we're, so we're asking, what does it mean to manage for fire in different ages under even age management? And I kind of broke this out into three age classes, even though I know that may not be what 
people do in their minds um, from a fuels and fire standpoint, this is what made sense to me. So the zero to 12 year range is like, is really the, um, the, the plantations that look like brush and burn like brush. And there's not a whole lot you can do with that scenario, um, unfortunately. Then you have the 12 to 25 year range where canopies um, have generally uh, shaded out the surface fuels closed in. And so then it's, there's a lot of questions of trade-offs. Um, what do I do with that stand and how does that result in trade-offs from a fire management standpoint? And then the 25 year plus stands, um, those that are older and more mature may have self thinned, may have been thin. Um, how do we consider um, these different strategies for managing for fire under these different age classes. So that, that will be a theme here um, from here on out. So on the left-hand side, I have a, um, a graphic that explains cover classes. And so all of those dots are like, basically as though you're looking down on a stand, each, stop, each dot is a tree. And I've got some pictures here um, to use as examples. So on the 5% or less, it's basically you know, it's like a savanna or a clear cut um, with some um, retained trees for leaf trees or whatnot. And then moving into a stand <clears throat> such as this one that's had some partial harvest. So the surface fuels um, have been released a bit because uh, light is reaching the forest floor more open. Um, getting down here where, and you know, the theme is how much light is coming through. So the less light you see, the more you know that things are really becoming um, closed in. And then down here is kind of that, um, the example I showed of a closed canopy younger plantation in that 12 to 25 year range where the, there's almost nothing growing on the forest floor. So what does reduced canopy cover do? Because we, you know, when we talk about reducing stand densities as a wildfire mitigation strategy, or we talk about thinning on the east side to reduce fire hazard, what does that do on the west side? Um, well, it can, and this, it doesn't always do this, but what can it do? Well, it can increase um, drying and wind exposure. It can result in surface fuel development on particularly on productive sites, but it can also reduce crown fire potential. So there's benefits and there's drawbacks to um, thinning and opening up a stand on the west side. On the east side, it's dry enough already that um, and not as productive. So you, you, there are places where you will see release of brush in ponderosa pine that's not um, desirable from thinning, um, but more often you don't see it right away. Um, but regardless on both sides, you, when you space the crowns out, you do reduce the crown fire potential. That doesn't mean you reduce the potential for undesirable impacts to the stand. Um, it may burn and scorch and not crown fire and the trees are all a loss anyways. So, so whatever that's worth. So I'm gonna walk through um, four different scenarios with um, fuels that are influenced by the reduction of canopy cover. And the first one is uh, a short needle compact timber litter. And that's going to be, even though this picture doesn't exactly look like it because I think this is a higher elevation stand with more uh, grand fur in it and such. Um, the point is short needle and compact. Those are key words. Uh, short needle conifer litter does not burn very well to begin with. It tends to compact pretty well. And when there's not a lot else around and that's all that there is for a fuel bed, it, it's very difficult to make it burn um, in ways that are very interesting. So we put it, um, I ran these under a, uh, with a modeling program called Behave. And I used a very steep slope, very low fuel moisture, um, fully cured live fuels, meaning that we're talking about the conditions of end of summer, beginning of fall, um, eight mile per hour wind, mid flame wind speed, which by the way mean, makes that closer to 20 because mid flame is reduced um, for sheltering effects from fuels. So wind hits fuels and it slows down. So we have a measurement we use in fire behavior modeling um, called mid flame wind speed, but if you were to look on the National Weather Service uh, forecast, it would give you a 20 foot or maybe an eye level. So the eight mile per hour is, is reduced and it's more like 20. Um, so the rate of spread is um, half a chain of hour and flame length is less than half a foot. So six inch flame length, very slow rate of spread, um, low to no crown fire potential, pretty easy firefighting. Um, 
or prescribed burning if that's what you're um, wanting to do. Moving next into very high load broadleaf litter. Um, I ran this to show a combination of um, long, leaf, long leaf pine needle litter and broadleaf litter. It's called very high load broadleaf litter, but in the models, um, there's descriptions of how to run them to include other fuels. So that's why I chose this one. And it has the same inputs in terms of fuel moisture, slope, et cetera. Um, and by the way, the reason that temperature is not represented here is because in the model, the fine dead fuel moisture, which that, by the way, refers to fuels that are a quarter inch diameter and less, and they're very responsive to changes in weather and relative humidity throughout the day. So we use that as a metric. Um, so that, that's the same fuel moisture that was used for um, all of these, of course. Um, and we see that the rate of spread is higher. It's 4.7 chains per hour. And we see the flame length of 3.6 feet. Um, the crown fire potential is moderate. Um, something to note with flame lengths. Firefighters are not really supposed to engage in any kind of um, suppression on fires that are over four feet in flame length. So when you're considering modifying fuels to modify fire behavior, um, that break point is really important because if you can keep your flame lengths potentially on your property and in, in, in your forest below four feet, then that gives firefighters the opportunity to come in and be more direct. If the flame lengths are higher, they have to back off because it's just simply not safe for them to engage. So these first two are pretty good candidates for um, for firefighting, that's with hand tools, by the way. Now, you know, bigger flame lengths with other resources, um, you know, aircraft and whatnot, that's, that's fine. But just sending people in, walking into a fire type thing, if they come up on something that's more than four feet flame length, they really are supposed to back off and disengage and come up with a new plan. Moving into the next fuel um, model, I looked at high load grass and shrubs and, um, not surprisingly, even higher uh, rate of spread at 10.9 chains per hour. Um, for those who don't know what a chain is at 66 feet, it's a very common um, uh, metric used in, in wildland firefighting. We often say one more chain, and that's really re referring to how much longer do we have before our fire line is completed if we're um, actively in a firefight, putting a fire out. Um, and then we see these flame lengths, 10.3, and that's not going to be something a firefighter can go do anything about without more than just their hand tools. Um, and of course, as we'd expect, high crown fire potential. And then in my last example, um, I used a high load slash blow down to mimic um, slash left in, in open areas um, in clear cuts and such. And um, that we get even more impressive, um, 60.8 chains per hour rate of spread and um, 13 foot flame length. So not gonna do much with that. Um, another example of backing off and, and finding an indirect strategy um, for managing a fire in fields like this. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, management techniques and that's pretty much the rest of my uh, presentation is talking about different kinds of approaches to um, mitigating fire hazard and what are the trade-offs and, um, and what, what might you want to consider before engaging in those. <clears throat> um, at the bottom we have the ground fuel stratum that, that's mosses, lichens, litter, stumps, um, woody fuel and, and that's really the stuff that smolders has residual impacts. Um, if you want to reduce the unintended impacts of those residual smoldering effects, you might want to um, rake around trees that you care about, for example. Um, or maybe you want to, you know, take care of some of the heavier fuels um, that are around things that you don't want to have negative impacts from. Um, the residence time of residual smoldering can often kill trees that have no scorch at all, especially ponderosa pine. I've seen that in pile burning. So, um, just being really mindful of that um, phase of the combustion process. Um, and the surface fire, we have, um, of course, some of the things that are residual and smoldering are also part of the surface fire equation. So we have um, woody fuel, low vegetation, and shrubs. And that really is going to be impacted, that fuel layer is going to be impacted by um, surface and ladder fuel reduction, such as mastication. Um, 
and this I'm really kind of focusing on um, how do you break up the vertical continuity of fuels? How do you keep things out of the crowns? Um, and then the, the top layer is the canopy and the shrub stratum. And that's where crown fires happen. And while you can have an independent crown fire under the most extreme conditions that just travels through the canopy, um, generally speaking, it's reliant on surface fire um, to initiate that. So if you can break up the relationship between the surface and the crowns, and then you can break up the crowns between um, amongst the, the trees themselves and break up the canopy, then um, those will ha all have impacts on the fuel bed and associated fire behavior. So now launching into what, what, are, what are some actions and, and what are the trade-offs? Um, you know, I think the most important point to drive home here is that um, understanding your piece of the land and how you can manage it for fire resilience um, will greatly be aided um, by your understanding of mapping of stand age and appropriate treatments for different ages of trees, um, existing access um, and whether it needs to be maintained, constraints with habitat, um, and then your overall land management objectives. So looking at um, management options and trade-offs. Um, the first one that I, I'm a pretty big fan of is um, increasing the crown base height or canopy base height. Um, that can be achieved through many different means. Um, one of my favorites is um, using prescribed fire. It's a great way to get crown lift um, when the trees are thick barked old and old enough to um, withstand that. Um, I did a lot of that kind of burning when I worked on the Sister Stranger District, and um, that was a common thing that people would say, get that crown lift, get that crown lift. Um, but really, I think that the more practical methods um, involve pruning, and there's always some risk of injury, and also depending on what you're pruning in the time of year, you might want to consult with your um, local extension forester or ODF stewardship forester to make sure that, for example, if you're pruning pine in the, or you're cutting pine or anything like that at certain times of year, that's not um, a good thing because it can bring in ips beetles and such. Um, and then of course there is some slash produced. So you wanna to tend to that if, if it's enough to um, be of concern. There's not a ton of negatives other than the risk of injury um, and slash production when it comes to increasing crown base height. We really encourage folks um, to do that. I think especially in those closed canopy plantations where there's not a lot of ground fuel, um, if you do some pruning, I think those stands may be the best suited to survive negative um, impacts from wildfires. Next on the list of management options and trade-offs is um, light thinning and pile burning. Um, I'm including those older stands because um, you know thinning stands under 12 years old, you know, may not really produce any measurable benefits and may have some negative silvicultural outcomes. Um, so I'm kind of leaving that in the older trees. Um, I think that it has been a common practice in Western Oregon to thin in um, plantations and not necessarily pile or remove the slash. And that is partially because we recognize that the likelihood of fire in that short window during which the needles are still red and on those um, not on the slash is fairly short. And so I think more often than not, folks kind of roll the dice on that. We might consider changing that approach in the future if we are indeed expecting to see more um, frequent wildfire than what we've seen in the last hundred years. Um, anytime as I've already made the point here that you um, open up the canopy, you potentially increase the surface fuel loading. Um, so things to consider that um, will break up that canopy continuity in, at the horizontal level in the, can in the crowns, which is a good thing, but um, may not end up um, doing much for you on the surface unless you do something to maintain the surface fuels. Um, and this is kind of a similar scenario, but really looking at the older trees. Um, and I think that it's just kind of reinforcing the increased surface fuel loading. Um, and then that really may be requiring some kind of maintenance. So if you're gonna do this, what are you gonna do to try to maintain that? Um, 
is are you going to try to masticate it or are you just going to leave it alone hope for the best i'm not sure that there's much you can do but if nothing else it's good to be aware of um, you know what some of the consequences of management actions are in these older open um, more open stands mastication um, can be a really effective technique for reducing fuels um, it's there's limitations with regards to um, slope and access as well as um, you know some of the equipment being large enough that it's kind of hard to move around and, and you know work around leaf trees um, I think that the, the fact that the fuels remain in place and are just rearranged is important to remember. If you're on a site that has a high rate of decomposition, that may not be a factor for very long. That, that may, they may break down fairly quickly. Uh, there is potential for the suppression of the herbaceous layer as well as um, making it difficult for seeds to germinate. Um, but perhaps that would have a beneficial effect if you're trying to suppress something such as a weed species. And then I think the biggest benefit from mastication is the mulching effect that um, retains a lot of the moisture in the soil and um, does help provide a little fertilizing for the residual stand. Um, with my background in prescribed fire, this is my favorite um, alternative, but it's also probably the most difficult to achieve. Um, and I'm only really recommending this in stands over 25 years old, depending on the species. So these are very general recommendations for consideration. Um, you have to have some skills, water delivery, equipment, um, permits, smoke management considerations, permits from ODF, um, and sometimes other agencies need to be acquired. Um, it's often the most effective economical and ecologically appropriate option. Um, generally speaking, if if I had my druthers um, and I was given a stand like this before it was thinned, um, I'd probably want to do some redu reduction of the density first before applying fire. But if I was to only use fire as a standalone tool, it would be the least expensive way to do it. It just has, fire has, um, I guess, less, um, oh, it's, it's like a, it's not a, a scalpel, it's a chainsaw, it's a coarse tool. So you may lose a tree that you don't wanna lose and that's just kind of the way it goes. So um, liability and insurance or other considerations with underburning. And um, I just be strongly recommend you consider those things before engaging that on your property. Um, but just consider that this is a tool that is very effective and that I really think we need to use more of. And then um, I think this is, something that I'm gonna be focusing more and more on in my work is um, helping folks think through access, um, fuel breaks, control lines, and other ways that we can um, delineate spaces for fire operations in advance rather than reacting at the time up. Um, roads and trails, um, power line corridors can all be fire breaks themselves, but they can also be access points and fuel breaks themselves can be shaded, they can be open, um, power line corridors can be fuel breaks. Um, so the main thing about all of these options is that they require maintenance. And so um, being committed in the long run to taking care of whatever your investment might be. And this really goes for all of these approaches, but in particular, some more than others. And um, I would just recommend that, that the exercise of mapping and maintaining roads be considered and that kind of goes back to um, you know, firefighters having safe places to work because their ability to reach a fire and leave it if they need to is so important. So to whatever extent you can um, focus on that in your management, I think is really beneficial. So I'm gonna wrap it up before I turn it over to Glenn with my summary. Um, my take homes are that um, we do this um, to create safe spaces for firefighters to protect our homes and natural resources and wildlife habitat and investments in harvest. Um, fire has been here for a long time. It's, it's shaped Oregon's forested ecosystems as well as its grasslands and rangelands and coastal headlands um, for many, many years. So 
you know, we're kind of recent players on that scene and understanding that history and context would really help us um, become um, better stewards of land and fire in the future. Um, understanding the difference between the way fuels on the east side and the west side of the Cascades respond to fuels and fire differently and requiring different kinds of maintenance. Um, and then, you know, just kind of um, finishing up with that understanding about how your uh, forest can be managed for resilience um, and fire, depending on the stand age, existing access, habitat constraints, and land management objectives. And with that, I will take questions. Thank you, Amanda. Okay, we are going to take a few minute break here and answer some questions before we go back to our second half of the presentation today. So there were a couple questions that came into the chat box. Um, the first one here is, can't we expect the frequency of fire in all areas to increase due to the higher population than when indigenous peoples populated these areas? Hmm, that's a good question. Let me think about that for a minute. Um, so I don't think we really know how many people were living here um, because the, I mean, if we're just talking about the Willamette Valley, let's just use that as a case study. Um, many, many of the peoples here were, um, died of disease before the settlers arrived. And so I don't think we really know, but I, I know there were a lot of people here, but I would add to that, that we have, uh, such a campaign in, um, in fire prevention that never occurred during that time frame. And so it's a question of how many fires were happening, you know, per capita, for example, then versus now. And if every person was responsible for five to 10 fires, then maybe that would override um, the population now. But um, I think that, I think we can expect frequency of fire in all areas to increase anyways, regardless of what that looks like relative to when indigenous people. Um, and I would add the indigenous people live here today. They populate these areas today. There's just not as many of them. So they don't, they're not the dominant people at this time. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Okay. And then we have another question here. Uh, when bringing in equipment to clear brush, can it damage the roots of the trees that you are trying to protect? I'm thinking that they may damage or crush some of the roots that are closer to the surface. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think that that is possible in some cases with larger pieces of equipment, but you know we have um, logging equipment running through the forest all the time. That's pretty much that's quite a bit bigger than um, a masticator. Um, you know you can use a fairly small bobcat to masticate with, and that's not going to have a ton of impact. Another thing is that if they're slashed down on the surface of the ground already, that can buffer the impacts of um, the equipment and the tracks that they might leave. Um, it's certainly a possibility, but I would say um, the likelihood that you're going to have that impact at a, at a landscape level is pretty slim. It, it would be more like a couple trees maybe would be impacted that way, but um, and maybe not even that many. Okay, uh, and then there are two questions here about the um, presentation. Um, one question is, is the vegetation map available somewhere? I'd be interested in referencing it. And then is it possible to have access to these slides? Um, so I guess that would be something if you wanted to add that to the resources section after yeah. the webinar, we can see about doing that. Yeah, I'm happy to, um, to provide the slides and I am happy to, now I, the, if it's the veget, I'd like to know which map specifically, if it was the, um, I think he was probably asking about that, but they'll, it'll all be in the slides. So, um, so that'll be available as part of the, the PowerPoint. And I can tell you where that came from too. Um, looks like two more rolled in. Um, can civilians be trained to fight spot fires in a firestorm? Yes, they can, and they should. And um, there's rural fire departments, volunteer fire departments all over the place where folks sign up to be a part of that. Um, I know Tom and he's living here, um, here in my geography and we've talked a little bit about this. Um, so I think to maybe attend to that a little more 
there are some places where that might be more challenging than others, depending on the fire jurisdiction. Um, but there's a lot of volunteer departments out there who are looking for people to help. So I would highly recommend for those who are interested in that to, um, to, to go, go in and, and let it be known that you're interested in that. Uh, and then one more question here. From a, a biodiversity and wildlife perspective, mastication sounds really destructive. What have you observed in that regard? And are there ways to reduce ladder fuels without that destruction? Yeah, um, yeah, mastication can be um, pretty hard on an area, but I, I'd say it, it, it's destructive in the sense that, um, you know, it, it leaves a lot of stuff behind that looks quite different than what was there before. Um, I would say that if you want to reduce ladder fuels without using mastication, um, hand work is just fine. Um, you know, you can, there have, people have been cutting brush and piling it for a long time, long before they were masticating it. So there's any work that you're doing by hand is potentially going to be um, more precise. And, you know, the benefit of that, for example, would be if you only want to cut brush that you know is really flammable and you want to leave um, you know, sword ferns or other less flammable vegetation, then you have that ability to choose which one you want. So, um, so I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that mastication is without harm in terms of um, impacting the non-targeted species. Okay, great. Well, I think we should continue on with our presentation and then we'll have uh, more time at the end for questions. So Glenn, I will turn it over to you for the rest of the presentation today. Okay, <laughs> thanks, Jacob. Actually, I have a, a question for Amanda and I might ask your help as I go through my part of this presentation. So if you could stay stand by Amanda and I might call on you to discuss some of the, the things that come up for me. Um, but I have a question. Do you, you know, have a idea of kind of the, the costs or the comparison between prescribed burning and mastication? If you had, you know, a site where that could be done, um, you know, have you looked at that? Yeah, so um, it's really hard to give a per acre figure on how much prescribed burning costs, I unfortunately. Um, I always say the smaller the unit, the more expensive it is because you still have to have all those people there and all the stuff there. And I can usually burn 100 acres in a day as easily as I can burn 10 acres. So if I burn 100 acres, it's a lot less per acre than I burn if I burn 10 acres. So that's a caveat up front. Um, but I will say that I can generally get prescribed burning done for $100 an acre. And I've not really seen mastication for under 200. And if it's heavy in whole tree mastication, you're looking at more like $350 an acre. So it was probably about a third uh, on average. And that's just mastication. So if you were going to thin, pile burn, and masticate a unit before you prescribe burn it, you know, you're like $1,000 at least there. Um, but the alternative of thinning by fire is really, um, as I call it, sporty burning. So can be fun or not, depending on the day. Sporty. Um, sporty, yeah. So while that can cost $100 an acre and you get all that full suite of treatments done, it's great as long as it doesn't go south on you. But if it goes south on you, then, you know, you should have just spent the money to do a full suite of treatments. Okay, I appreciate that. I, I'd like to just keep asking you questions for the rest of my, my time here. But um, uh, so at this time, I should uh, introduce uh, Brad with her Robinson as well. Uh, so uh, Brad and I uh, starting out thinking about how we wanted to address managing your forest with fire in mind. Uh, we're both uh, OSU extension foresters, uh, kind of a similar cohort. Uh, been an extension forester for 20 years uh, and been a forester for close to 35. Um, had a variety of other kinds of jobs before that, but really focused now on trying to understand, um, you know, science-based information and then experience um, and sharing and education with landowners and how to manage forests in this, this um, context with fire now. So Brad and I really are, neither of us are fire experts. Um, and Brad, I don't know if you would like to uh, say hello um, uh, and, and show your face for a moment if you could, but um, 
neither of us are, are fire experts. We're both, uh, you know, trained foresters with some background in fire and fire ecology and, and forest management. And we recognize that we're working with fire driven ecosystems here. Um, but we were very happy that Amanda uh, came on board in October as someone with a lot more uh, background and specialty in fire. And then unfortunately, she had to come in the aftermath of these terrible fires, which really uh, Get kicked us hard and made us want to look at how to manage with fire in mind, and particularly in my case on the west side. Uh, Brad, I don't know if you have any other comments you'd like to add, but at least say hello. Thank you, Glenn, and uh, great job, Amanda. No, this has been a conundrum for people like me and Glenn who've been west side forces and, and haven't confronted the fire issue as much as some of our colleagues in um, southern Oregon or central Oregon and is causing us to rethink a lot of the different things that, that we do and, and try to be a little more expansive of how we manage properties and individual stands to meet a range of different management objectives, aesthetics, habitat, and start more actively including fire in, in our thinking. Because as Amanda was pointing out, there's some real contrasts between what we might want to do if we're managing for a wildlife objective in one situation and we start looking at that, that management or, or that structure a little differently when we start thinking about the fire. So I appreciate Amanda doing that presentation to give us some groundwork. And then Glenn has said, well, I have some things I'd like to share from his active work at the Hopkins tree farm in balancing this. And so I'm gonna sign off and let Glenn do that because he's been, he's been working on this as a, uh, um, in a lot of different ways, including as, as part of the management team there at Hopkins. Very good, thanks, Brad. So I will go ahead and get started on that. And Okay, so hope everybody can see that. And I'll get going. So my background, I'm just going to give a forester's perspective. And as I mentioned, uh, more of a west side forester's perspective, I am have worked a bit on the east side, but mostly I've been uh, west of the Cascades and in the more moist forests of Western Oregon and Washington in my career. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'll just give you my perspective on that. And part of that perspective is, you know, having worked on the West side for most of my career, uh, our approach to forestry, we know it's a, a fire driven system, but we're used to the more moist forest as Amanda showed us, uh, you know, being on that higher severity fire regime where they don't tend to burn. In this case, in the coast range, they don't tend to burn, but every hundred or few hundred years. Uh, so I've showed this example of, a, you know, a managed forest landscape of, of both small private and larger private forest owners, uh, primarily Douglas fir management. And this is an area um, in Lincoln County, you know, east, east of Newport, uh, where the Yaquinta burn would have been burned, had burned in the mid 1800s. And there hasn't really been a big stand replacement fire in this landscape since uh, we really converted it to this managed system. Um, and in general, because fire is so rare, and because now that we've uh, got roads and access, we pretty much have relied on the infrequency of fire, the very uh, rare event of having it be dry enough uh, and also to have ignitions, uh, having controlled access, having good road systems, having aggressive fire suppression to put fires out. And that has generally been successful in the past. And so we don't tend to look too hard at managing within a stand to make it fireproof uh, in the way that we would in, in an east side context uh, where it was dominated by frequent fire. And closer to the home for me in my area in the Clackamas County area. Um, this is an aerial view looking at Hopkins Demonstration Forest and the, you know, the farm forest landscape of Clackamas County, but very common around the valley. There's about uh, 650,000 acres of uh, family forests, kind of like this, with um, you know, 15 to 20,000 owners, depending on how you look at us. Um, and this was an environment that was more of a mixed severity fire historically, but in the last 150 years, um, certainly the forests have, have grown up uh, and fire has not really happened in a large scale since um, 
since uh, Native Americans um, stopped burning and, and then the, the early settlers um, haven't burned a lot. So now we're looking at forests that are well developed in the absence of fire and, and then they're being managed. Uh, I should say then, you know, as a forester trying to pay more attention to managing with fire in mind, you know, I go, we have a, a good supply of resources, our extension forestry and other uh, of our partners, you know, been studying and learning about fire and forestry for a long time. Um, this guide actually has a great summary of uh, all the things that Amanda talked about, uh, what you can do in terms of managing the distribution of fuel and separating the crowns with thinning and pruning and lifting the ladder fuels and controlling ground fuels and the tools and techniques for that. Um, of course, the cover has a nice ponderous of pine forest with sort of a park-like understory. And, and our, again, our struggle is these techniques can be applied in West Side Forest, but how do we do that? Uh, it's a very different situation with the high rate of productivity and higher stand densities. So as I start thinking about this more specifically, you know, the basics of understanding what your situation is uh, in terms of, you know, management planning, your forest management plan, uh, what are the conditions on the ground in your land? So I'm kind of speaking from the perspective of one um, person at a time or one landowner at a time, and then your, your kind of neighborhood and your immediate landscape setting. Um, I should point out that actually the the, uh, the poll that we did about who you are in our audience is that uh, about 70% of you were from uh, the Willamette Valley and the vast majority from the west side. Um, there was actually a good number of folks who aren't landowners or maybe just uh, tuning in to learn about how we view uh, forestry and you know, with fire in mind, of course. Um, but again, I think I am talking about what most of you are, are uh, familiar with is more of a west side context. But the basics of understanding uh, your landscape setting or your property is the foundation of learning to manage uh, and understand how your forest um, you know, we'll go from here to the future and mapping your vegetation now with fuel types in mind, as well as, uh, you know, the basic types of how old is it, how dense is it, uh, you know, what what's next for this this particular patch of vegetation. But we always want to, you know, map our different patches of vegetation, kind of understand what we got. And then, of course, it helps us plan uh, what we might be doing in terms of management. And when we look at assessing that risk, uh, you know, risk is sort of this combination of the hazard, which is the fuel, and then there's the the, the values at risk, whether you have homes or high value timber, uh, or other aspects of the property that you know are threatened that you put more emphasis on protecting. Um, and then you know, how often do we expect uh, ignitions? You know, what's our fears of of uh, you know lightning or power lines or our neighbors starting fires? And where is it going to come from? And then what's our capability um, to you know jump on that and suppress a fire that's accidentally started? Um, those are all kind of part of assessing you know that aspect. So some of you may have been uh, for a previous tree school webinar with Steve Fitzgerald, our silviculture specialist. And when Steve uh, gives a talk about forest management, uh, any of us uh, you know, foresters are, are talking, we, we look at kind of this cycle and where are you or where are, is a particular uh, stand or patch of vegetation that you're managing you know, in this cycle? Is it a young um, new regeneration site after harvesting or fire in this case, um, or converting from a pasture? Uh, you know, are you in that stage of getting trees established and, and managing the weeds and making sure the trees make it? And then there's this long period and maybe this is all you're dealing with is existing stands of trees and you're looking at how you tend that stand with thinning or pruning. Uh, some people are busy weeding, uh, fertilizing, uh, doing things to improve that stand. Uh, liberation might be, you know, releasing trees that are being suppressed by other trees, diversifying with species that you want to favor to get more different species. Um, all these things that we might do, uh, stand tending, well, of course, with fire in mind, we're going to want to put the fuels and the fire behavior aspects into this equation. And honestly, on the west side, again, a lot of us haven't, that's been low on our list. Uh, here it's on the bottom of the list, um, but it hasn't always risen up as a high priority. And then again, how we choose to manage if we're harvesting or if we're, if we're thinning, um, are we doing clear cutting? Are we having a multi-layered or complicated stand structure? And so you've got to be, I have to be thinking about this system, this management system or silviculture system and where that fits in. And uh, taking a slide from Steve Fitzgerald about the different ways uh, that we might be looking at a forest, what kind of forest is it? Uh, what kind of structure, you know, meaning the, 
the arrangement of the trees, the tall ones and the short ones, single, you know, uniform canopy versus a mixed uh, canopy or mixed age forest, mixed species, patchiness uh, versus uniformity, all these things about what do you want your forest to look like? And that's um, at, over time as it grows up or as it changes and as you influence it and how are you gonna, gonna get it there? So if you are lifting a finger to manage and change that, um, then you know that's is what you're working with is adding trees or removing trees uh, and managing vegetation. And so now when we overlay fire into this picture, how do these different stand structures look to you uh, if you're thinking about what Amanda was talking about in terms of fuels and, and connectivity of ground fuels to canopy um, and the horizontal kind of patchiness that would uh, maybe change uh, the fire or slow down the rate of spread, those kinds of things. And that's again what I'm, I'm really starting to think about a lot more. So it kind of comes back to then understanding, you know, your conditions, but then your vulnerability and what then if you look at something that is valuable and that you want to protect, uh, you look at your your stands in relation to your neighbors um, and you know what's next door where the fire might be coming from, uh, what can you do to manage that? And so within a patch, between your patches, uh, and then at the boundary and beyond into the landscape with your neighbors. Uh, and then integrating that fire hazard and risk reduction, some of the techniques that we're learning about uh, and trying to adapt uh, on the west side along with your other objectives. And I don't think any of us are going to completely throw out a bunch of other objectives and have number fire as the number one objective fire uh, risk mitigation, but it's got to be part of it more and more. And then a big one, of course, the thing that we've all along are doing is looking at access, um, lines of defense, um, fuel breaks and things like that um, within our property or again at the landscape level. So I'm going to go back to the Hopkins demonstration forest and uh, focus a little bit more. So this is a view actually looking down uh, on our forest. It's about 140 acres. Uh, the low end of the creek is 400 feet elevation. The higher end is about 700 feet at the hilltop. Um, if you can see actually the neighbor's house there at the end. So we're looking at the, uh, you know, the, the north and the west boundaries um, about eight miles south of Oregon City. Uh, and I'm looking at the landscape and where, you know, in this case, the uh, northeast and the east winds, particularly as an example of that recent horrible day <laughs> or two when that wind was blowing and we were wondering if the fire would reach us here at Hopkins. Um, the closest one stopped about five miles away and the wind died down, but it would have come probably from the, uh, the upper right of this photo from the, the east and the north and come down the drainage. Um, and so what would I be thinking about? And again, we often are not looking at, um, you know, within a stand trying to make it fireproof. We're just expecting that um, fire is so rare that, you know, we might hold lines of defense, but we'd expect to be able to manage a stand for 30, 40, 50 years without expecting fire to enter that stand. Um, and maybe that assumption might need to change. So as we look at the many different types of management that we're doing at Hopkins, as we're, our goal is to do a lot of management and demonstrate different types of management that are similar to what other landowners might try uh, or maybe try some new things to demonstrate alternatives. So we have uh, 20 some different types of management units and we've tried a lot of different things. Uh, we're not that different from a lot of our, our neighbors, uh, but maybe we've diversified a bit more. If you look at this map, um, you see that there's a, a, a creek with the red lines as our riparian area and that's the bottom of the property. And then uh, again, where the fire might come from in one case with an east or northeast wind is on the, uh, the right hand side of the property uh, and, then, and then the lower part. Uh, so the creek um, and that bottom of the property might be a fairly natural fire break. And there's a road along that creek as well. So thinking you know, strategically again, um, this is about where the fire coming from uh, the neighbors and from the east and the north might come into the property. Uh, and this could be one of our, our lines of defense. Uh, right now, um, in this photo, a couple of years ago, you know, how would we change the way we manage that roadside vegetation if we're starting to think of it more strategically uh, in mind with the uh, maybe a really working hard on the understory, uh, thinning out the different layers of cedar and shrubs and having more of a shaded fuel break, for example, 
Um, or if we were to harvest, uh, which we have in some cases uh, further up this road, um, you know, how would we manage that road as a fire break? And once the, if the fire were to come from that direction and hit the bottom of this hill, it's all uphill and to the buildings and the high value infrastructure at the top of the hill about uh, you know, a quarter mile up. So that certainly would be an important thing for us to consider. And right across the creek from that road in that kind of a corner of our forest, we do have a small uh, harvest unit where we, it's about four acres. Um, and this is the post harvest condition. It was uh, clear cut with um, you know, a, a shovel logging machine. And then the slash at this stage was just kind of crunched down and left close to the ground. And one of the considerations, you know, when we were thinking about how to treat this slash, um, more and more forest owners maybe are avoiding piling and burning because of the difficulty of getting a burn window. If you're too close to cities and towns, you know, with smoke management, that can be a challenge. And quite a few folks are just working on, you know, scattering the slash and getting it close to the ground, like in this case, um, and then uh, just paying extra cost to plant through it. Uh, letting this all decompose and go back to the earth. Um, but we were pretty concerned about fire hazards and um, also plantability and kind of more in the old fashioned way of cleaning up the slash. So in our case, we did a more traditional uh, piling and burning approach over most of the area uh, and maybe even excessively so um, because this is what it looked like after we finished with the piling and burning. But again, this was our sort of boundary with our neighbors and one of the directions from which uh, fire might come uh, burning downhill in this case. But if the wind is behind it, it could go right down the drainage and then across the creek to the other side. And then this is, you know, three or four years later. Uh, one of the questions I'd have for Amanda, actually, um, if you want to jump in here, is if I had left this slash and we had planted, um, what's the difference in the fire behavior when you're at this stage um, and going, growing up into you know the first 10 years, um, what effect is you know a foot of slash underneath uh, you know the usual vegetation recovery, which would have been of course a little different with that much slash. What what are your thoughts on that? Um, well, that would increase fire behavior. Um, I guess I would say that the grass will burn too, but it the uh, it doesn't have the same negative impacts, or I mean, it may, it may or may not have the same <laughs> negative impacts, I guess I would say, but you, you're increasing the risk to the trees you planted by leaving the slash in place. Yeah, I mean, um, I would assume that fire, would, that the trees would be a lost cause regardless at this small stage. Yeah, uh, at this stage, you're right. But I'm thinking again, uh, how much difference does, uh, you know, a foot or less of woody debris that's, that's mashed down onto the ground make in fire behavior. I, I mean, I it would have thought- It makes more of a distant difference than you think. I'm sorry, what would you have thought? No, go ahead. I'd like well, to Well, it just has to do with the BTUs um, and just the intensity. So it's just going to burn hotter and have likely more negative impacts on the soil. Um, you would have more of that residual smoldering effect and that can neutralize soils. Um, it's more common when the, the, the slash is larger diameter um, but it's still going to put more heat into the soil and volatilize more nutrients than if you just have grass in place. So the soil would suffer more. Um, the fire behavior would be more substantial. And then the time frame during which you would have to deal with fire would be much longer. If you burn, if this burned as it is in the slide you have up, um, there would be a few things smoldering around for a while, but it wouldn't take very long for it to be over with because it's mostly fine fuels. You have that other area on fire, you're gonna to have to tend that until it's out because there's so much there that's gonna take much longer to burn. So it's a bigger time commitment and investment to do what we call mop up, which is what we do after we've cut a fire off from spreading, we gotta go put it to bed completely. So there would be a ton of work involved in that um, with the slash that's left over as well. But regardless, it's gonna burn hotter and more intensely and potentially have negative impacts to the adjacent stand beyond what you would have with the grass. Yeah, and and I kind of emphasize that because that's one of those trade-offs because a lot of us were considering, you know, less intensive slash treatment and let it go back to the earth. Um, and then after walking through a lot of the areas that burn, uh, I'm much more fearful of even that much slash left even that close to the ground. Uh, and particularly, of course, if you get into a, a stand level. 
so moving uh, up in age, um, this is actually uh, from my Coast Range days. So I leave the Hopkins forest, but I had a nice window into this, you know, more 25 year age class of forest um, and a kind of a typical plantation situation or uh, planted forest with uh, 400 some trees per acre to 10 foot spacing and it had not been thin, but it certainly turns the lights out and you could conceivably think about, you know, the stand is self pruning and it, you could hasten that along with active pruning. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, this is from a thinning study where we have an alternative, which is the same uh, planted forest that had been thinned earlier on and uh, to more like 150 trees per acre, 200, uh, 150 to 200 trees per acre. And of course, a much more lush uh, understory. But again, in this situation, you know, we could consider pruning the trees up and the crowns are more separated, but they're still with Douglas fir going to close and, and be a, a closed canopy, um, you know, already even in this slide, you know, they're getting there. Um, so, you know, this is something we often are doing is wanting to avoid a situation like this. We'd like to thin, uh, to have more understory and to have more healthy and vigorous tree crowns. But now I'm thinking of it in terms of uh, fuels management um, and kind of what's the trade off between this kind of a situation um, and this kind of situation. Um, and as you let that same kind of forest back to Hopkins now in one of our thinning studies, um, it used to look uh, perhaps more like this one. Um, but now at age 40, this stand had been planted at 10 foot spacing and then it, uh, it went without thinning in this case and the tree sort of sorted things out and self thin and we have a um, kind of a sparse sword for an understory and trees that are all well pruned up. Um, and so I could see that this actually would be a kind of a shaded uh, fuel break in a way, but I know that sword fern would still carry a fire. Um, and contrast that to this, which is just across the road um, from this. Uh, this is an area that's been thinned twice and maintained at a lower density. Uh, we're starting to interplant. Um, and this is actually a more, more of a winter scene. So if this were in the summertime, this would be about, um, you know, four to eight feet of, of brush and uh, salal and all, shrubs and small trees. Um, uh, and this is about five years after thinning. Um, so I could almost envision this being more of a park-like stand, but what would it take to maintain that? On the west side, you'd have to be um, masticating or cutting brush uh, every uh, you know, five years or so uh, to main anything, maintain a park-like stand. So if I'm thinking of this as a fuel break, um, or, a, you know, wondering how the fire will behave when it enters that stand from a, another one. You know, I look at this forest and think, well, the fire would actually uh, be a lot more manageable on the ground. And how would you contrast these two situations, Amanda? Um, well, I would say that, um, could you switch back to the other one real quick? Okay. Um, I, I just think that the openness of the second stand um, it just allows more wind to impact it and, and then go back to the other one. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, this has just got more, it's just got more sheltering from the wind and sword fern is not a particularly great carrier of fire, whereas there was a lot of um, dead herbaceous material in the other one. They, these were probably taken at different times of year and that's, it's really hard to remove that bias from visual um, aids. But, um, but I would say that you know, this one looks a little younger, um, so the trees might be a little more susceptible, but if I was to be charged with um, predicting which one would burn more readily, it would be the more open stand, not this one, but the other one. Um, right. uh, and they actually were taken the same time of year, but the sword fern was all still green in March. Well, see, there uh, you go. So uh, that, that's a good example then. Um, yeah. And and you can, all that dead bracken fern in there and um, that stuff really burns well. Um, and, and again, it really has to do with um, exposure. And, and also something I didn't mention, but that um, solar radiation received is higher and solar radiation affects fire behavior so much that when the holiday farm fire and all the other West Side fires were burning, the columns of smoke that they produced shaded themselves out and it is part of what reduced their spread. They would have burned far more, they would have been hotter and further than they did if they hadn't shaded themselves out and removed solar radiation from the impact to fire spread. 
So it's just got me thinking about the trade-offs. We are usually looking at thinning to change stand structure to, uh, you know, increase the vigor of our residual trees. Uh, and sometimes we want to have, you know, in a mix of different stand types, more understory uh, for diversity. Uh, going to some of our older stand types, here's an 80-year-old stand. This was the natural second growth that came up after logging in the 30s and 40s um, at Hopkins. And this part, we just have left it and not not ever been thin and it has a lot of um, trees that have been competing with each other for a long time as well as understory development with cedar uh, and other trees um, and you contrast that with uh, the same stand on the other side of the road that we thinned uh, three times uh, in 30 years uh, purposely to diversify the stand and also managing the the trees for a larger um, slightly larger uh, Douglas fir tree for a uh, for a pole timber um, a component of, as well, uh, but a very different understory and, and layering of stands that's starting here, um, which you know we're thinking of as a nice diverse stand in terms of both stand structure, some higher value trees, as well as the um, diversity. But there, here we have a lot of more, I would say, ground fuel uh, connections, but it's also kind of patchy. And so I'm trying to get my head around, you know, this is a a 10 acre hillside that leads up to our buildings at the top. And so, you know, what's the, the contrast between both of these stands are on that hillside. Uh, and so it's making me think about how, how would fire behave differently in these two stands? You have any comments, Amanda? There we go. Okay. So this one, and then can you show the other one again? Okay. So it's hard, the, the only thing that makes it tougher with these is that I can't really see what the ground fuel looks like in this one, but I would just say based on um, like the crown fire potential may be higher if it ends up in that um, condition, but if the ground fuel is less because it's so shaded, then it's kind of like um, it has a higher risk during a shorter period of time, whereas the other one has a lower risk during a larger period of time in some ways because it's so open. I mean, this is this is re really open compared to the other one. Yes. Um, but the trees are mature, and perhaps they would they would weather. And let's just not assume that the kind of fire event that we just saw was happening. But say it was something a little bit more moderated, then my guess would be that, that the overstory would be fine. It's got nice thick bark on the trees there. The other one looked like it was um, not as old. And, um, and again, it kind of gets back to, I would assume that the, the surface fields are limited here because of the shading, but if ground fire did get established in the crowns, it would take off because they're so close together. Right. Yeah, actually the, most of the sand is about the same age and this is just what's crowded uh, and the timbers more cylindrical. Uh, there is some um, ingrowth as well. And the understory, as you might expect, is very sparse in that dense part of this forest versus this one that has a lot more shrub layer. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, again, this is kind of the, the thing I'm thinking about. We have a nice road in between the two uh, that would also make a, a you know, a, a fire break. But again, having reached this point with these larger trees, then we have something to work with. So we're going forward from here and, you know, looking at vulnerability of this stand. And so the large thick bark trees, you know, would have uh, more uh, resiliency. And Amanda made a good point is that we're not necessarily looking for this horrendous hundred year event we've got to be protecting ourselves from the much more common uh, lower severity fires that nonetheless if they start at the neighbors and come across the way we would like to stand um, you know to survive and have a, something that's more manageable uh, when the wind is blowing 40 miles an hour and the fire is racing through you know it's all all bets are off it's a, a different situation perhaps uh, and then we're trying to just hold the line at, at you know the more defensible fire line in that extreme situation and, and around buildings and the last example here is uh, another type of forestry we're demonstrating is a more of a selective harvest instead of just thinning repeatedly in an older stand we're talking about purposefully growing multi age uh, trees and making gaps and regenerating um, new trees when we harvest an old tree and and hoping to kind of be more like uh, almost that east side forest with with a mixture of tree sizes. Um, but more smaller trees because we're not expecting fire to come through and kill them. And this is another you know, example of our um, kind of patchy multi-age stand management that has um, multiple layers and ages of trees coming up in it through selective harvesting. Uh, 
Uh, now, through all of these, when we do harvest, the slash is, we have not been piling the slash. So the slash is also uh, underneath uh, the brush in this case. And so this one in particular um, kind of scares me with the thought of fire getting up into this hillside. Also with the cedar layer um, as an understory, uh, cedar being fairly volatile and more flammable perhaps. Um, so um, I guess I'd be curious on your perspective on this one as well, Amanda. Yeah, so I would just say that, um, you know, the cedar is always going to be um, more flammable, as you noted. Um, but, you know, I kind of compare this one to being similar to the one that had older, thicker barge trees in it. Um, I think that the, the overstory might not have as good a chance um, because they're slightly younger and, you know, there's, there's some sort of, it looks like a cohort there of, of the, the incense cedar. So that complicates things a bit. Um, but I would I put it more into the same category of, um, you know, because the surface fuels are exposed and vigorously growing when they are cured and ready to burn, um, they're quite available and not sheltered because of um, the canopy removal. And then you add the cedar to that and that is an yeah. additional factor. So it's another example of trade offs So we have multiple objectives for, you know, in this case, forest diversity and habitat and having a continuous forest instead of, uh, you know, clear cutting and starting a whole new cohort again. Um, and we're also then looking at the uh, trade off with fire hazard. So I want to wrap up with that. So, you know, with forest fire in mind, um, practicing forestry, I just repeat one of Amanda's uh, main conclusions, which is you know, we really need to focus on first on the safe spaces for the firefighters accessing our property here, um, protecting, you know, the lines of defense. Uh, and for me, you know, this idea of understanding how the forest can be managed for fire, I'm really uh, on the learning curve. So I, I put the word learn more about how we might be managing this forest with fire resilience in mind. Um, again, with starting from where we are with our current mixture of stand uh, conditions and access and what do we do from here uh, to make it more fire resilient um, and with you know understanding our vulnerability and how we integrate the fire hazard and risk reduction with our objectives so with that um, before we go to q a i just want to put in a plug for the next tree school online uh, which is uh, Forest's Habitat for Wildlife and Priority Actions for Habitat Management with uh, Fran Caffredico and Julie Woodward. Um, so look forward to that January 5th. And it's time for questions. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. Um, so as we're moving into questions here, I'm just going to launch an evaluation poll. So if you could take a moment to answer that as we get the Q&A session going. So we did have two questions in the chat so far. Uh, the first one is, what equipment was used for the piling burning of the four acres at Hopkins and what was the cost? So the equipment was a, um, a shovel excavator with a claw um, and I believe the cost was about $2,500 for four to five acres. Uh, we got kind of a deal because uh, we have friends in the logging business who help us out. So that may not have been the most competitive uh, price. Okay. And then there's another question. Um, do you ever give talks on home hardening? So that might be a good suggestion for a future webinar. Yeah, most definitely. We, I'm not the expert on that, but we in our program on wildfire preparedness, um, you know, it starts anybody who has a home um, that, you know, is threatened by wildfire, as Amanda had in her, one of her early uh, slides is start with that building or that home and work your way out. And the home itself, uh, that big box of fuel and all this vulnerability, that's a key thing that we'll have an entire uh, seminar about that. We're going to be having more of those. Uh, we do them periodically. We had some last May and we're going to have some more in April and May. Uh, so that's definitely uh, uh, an important topic that we'll be covering. Yeah, and Amanda definitely helped me out with any uh, of the questions that we get here. 
Okay, we got another one here. Are there certain tree types more resistant to fire, lodgepole, redwood, oak, et cetera? Yeah, I think we can both work on that, Amanda. I mean, certainly uh, you mentioned redwood, coast redwood is very well adapted to fire. Uh, of course, it lives a long time and gets really thick bark that insulates it from fire. Um, you see a lot of them that have char on one side or the other, but they survived. And they also even sprout after fire. So if fire kills the top, the tree survives and sprouts back. Uh, Oregon white oak, when they get larger, you know, the classic Willamette Valley oak savannas. Uh, Amanda, you might be more qualified to talk about oak and fire resistance. Yeah, oaks, um, especially when they're older. So young oaks are susceptible to fire, but that doesn't mean that they um, are particularly hazardous um, when they burn somewhat. But, um, but as they grow older and larger, they're quite resistant to burning. Um, and then, you know, when Douglas fir are big and old, they tend to be similarly resistant to burning. All hardwoods um, have less uh, impact in terms of fire spread for the most part um, and tend to be a little more resistant to fire or adapted to it in the sense that they will re-sprout after burning. Yeah, and there's kind of two sides to that question of resistance. So one is, does the tree, you know, how flammable is it and how does it spread fire? And then how uh, resilient is it to survive fire? And, you know, those are kind of two aspects of it. And, and one thing I meant to mention is in those stands where we have a real patchy stand and we have a lot more deciduous, you know, maple, vine maple um, coming into it. And some of that is less flammable than the conifer alternative or having small conifers as ladder fuels. So I would think patches of the those deciduous hardwoods and more moist type vegetation, even if it's killed by the fire, it resists uh, the flame. It maybe doesn't flame as much and spread the fire. Is that right, Amanda? Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with um, the way in which the trees are oriented um, relative to their environment and the surface fuel. So some trees have a naturally high canopy or crown base height, a lot of space between the base of the tree and the crown, um, and others, their crowns go all the way to the ground. So trees that whose crowns touch the ground or come really close to it are very susceptible to torching, which releases embers and causes spot fires. Um, so I think as a general rule, conifers tend to be more um, less resistant to burning, whereas hardwoods, um, you know, tend to be more resistant. Yeah, and you know, I'm worried about that red cedar component because it's one of our favorite trees and it's shade tolerant and it's a nice thing to mix into our multi canopy stands. And yet now I'm a bit concerned about it in terms of that fire hazard and maybe focusing more on, um, you know, keeping the cedars off the ground at least and reducing their density. And anything you do to reduce the continuity of fuel, you know, to have a have places where the fire is going to slow down or go back down to the ground, as opposed to a continuous fuel base, you know, whether it's just ground fuels or or you know ladder fuels connecting, that all seems to be part of the strategy. Okay, great. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, could you discuss the difference between forest management in a rural forest as opposed to a urban forest in the wildland urban interface? Yeah, well, Amanda, do you want to start on that one? Sure. I think I would go back to the beginning of my presentation where I started with the home and um, then just remind us all that the home itself is also a source of fuel. And so when you're in the urban interface, you have to, to consider the way in which forests and environments interact with this home that you have or a building, which is fuel. So it's incredibly complicated um, when you get into this wooey, as we call it, the wildland urban interface, because we don't actually have a good grasp of how homes burn, especially when it's one home burning and then the next one starts burning and then the next one starts burning. And then there's also a forested vegetation component of that. Um, we know it's, it's, it's generally not good when it happens, but I would say we don't have as good a grasp on that as we do on forest management in rural areas where there's a lot of models, a lot of simulations, and a lot of um, previous success stories, and of course not so successful stories to refer to. Um, and just, you know, assuming this is just targeted towards fire specifically, um, I guess the simpler part of working in the wildland and urban interface is just that um, you can identify pretty clear boundaries where you want to focus your work. 
Whereas if you're treating an entire landscape, that can be challenging. Um, and in terms of coming up with the resources, accessing all the areas that need treatment, et cetera. So um, they're, both, they're both very important and they're both challenging in different ways. Um, but I think that we have our work cut out for us when it comes to the urban forest and the urban interface. And that's where I'd like to see more attention and work done in um, helping us understand the risk there and, and how we can mitigate hazards that um, are associated with it. So another thing that comes up, of course, is the small size of the lots um, in, you know, say a suburban or interface. And, you know, people are often asking, well, I don't, I, my trees and my vegetation and my garden is really important to me and I don't want a, a moonscape, you know. And so what are the techniques that you get to keep your landscaping, you're just changing its distribution and being mindful of some of the key vulnerabilities. And so the other aspect, of course, is that the 30 foot zone may the, be the extent <laughs> of your area of control, or the, at least the 100 foot zone could be the extent of the landscape you manage. And then it's all about your neighbors and your neighborhood. So another big thing is getting the homeowners association and the neighborhood to learn about this and agree. And sometimes it's helpful to get people to start working on it and show a good example and then people see what's happening um, and they say, oh, that looks like a good idea. Um, but again, you don't have to remove all the trees, but you have to arrange them such that they're not connecting the fire, uh, you know, the ground to canopy connection or having clumps of, of trees that might end up torching, <laughs> uh, but they're separated and they're far enough away from the house, et cetera, that, you know, there's a trade off there and, and keeping it green, keeping it irrigated, removing all the dead material more than you would do in the forest. But as a homeowner, you hopefully you have more intensity in your landscaping that you're going to remove all that dead stuff and rake the leaves and the needles and especially in fire season. Okay, uh, we've got a good question here uh, in regards to the changing landscape and species types changing in the Willamette Valley. So we're seeing more trees that are associated with Northern California thrive and more typical species like Doug firs are struggling. How do you think the transitioning forests factor in planning for future plantings? Yeah, well, that's one, especially after the fire, we have so many acres unexpectedly that people are gonna want to plant trees and we've gotten that question. And, you know, it's, it's, it's fairly complex, but Douglas fir to start with, which is, you know, 60% of the native forest and actually about 60% of the current forest west of the Cascades is Douglas fir, uh, fire adapted. It's also very genetically diverse. So Douglas fir growing in Medford is, is genetically different from Douglas fir growing in, you know, Salem area. Um, so we might not see Douglas fir go away, but we're wondering about which family of Douglas fir do we plant? Do we start looking at Douglas fir from further south? And then there are the other species. Um, uh, incense cedar is a one being considered because it's it's a very warm, dry, tolerant type species. It's native just south of, um, you know, I think it's in Eugene area is where you see uh, incense cedar coming in or, and, and I mean, the end of it, the northern end of it. Um, so that, uh, Coast Redwood is one that people are looking at. Um, but we really don't have a lot of good science-based guidance on exactly how to go about doing that. People are already experimenting and have for a long time. You can see good specimen trees of a lot of these species that aren't too far away from their native habitat. And so that is really uh, definitely on our radar is something that's we're huddling with the scientists to come up with better recommendations as to how to do that. But we're definitely looking into that and people are already trying it. And we need to have a kind of a science-based, climate-based uh, uh, guidance uh, with some ideas of what the changes might be. One of the caveats or the factors that we worry about is that a Douglas fir from um, Medford planted in um, here where I am in, in Clackamas County would not be happy with the cool moist conditions for the next 20 years. Uh, they're that um, locally adapted that we already know from plenty of there's a lot of experience going on right now to test these things and trees from California and Southern Oregon don't do well planted in uh, Northwest Oregon because of the moisture and the relatively cool temperatures. So they have to get through the next 30 years before they could adapt, be there to be adapted to the 50 year climate. 
Okay, we have another one here. Uh, is it ever permitted to use prescribed fire in those rural residential forested landscapes, or is that restricted to uninhabited forest land? I can Amanda. take that one. Yeah. Yes. Um, it is permitted to use prescribed fire in rural residential forested landscapes. If you are within Oregon Department of Forestry's jurisdiction, uh, they're the permitting agency that you would need to work with um, to gain permission to do that. Um, if you are not within Oregon Department of Forestry's jurisdiction, then you'd want to coordinate with um, whoever your fire response agency is for the area that you live in. Um, but it's certainly permitted. And I guess the thing I would um, add is that um, aside from permitting from Oregon Department of Forestry, um, if you are not within their jurisdiction, you have to go through the Oregon Department of Environmental Quality to make sure that you are um, aligning with their rules on smoke management. If you're within Oregon Department of Forestry's jurisdiction, they handle the smoke management side for you. So you have to get permission both to put fire down on the ground as well as to release the smoke from it. Um, if you're in Lane County and you're not in Oregon Department of Forestry's jurisdiction, you work with Lane Regional Air Protection Agency. Um, but yes, the short answer is it is permitted, um, but it may be more challenging um, because of the unintended impacts from smoke in particular, um, and especially in places where there's um, populations present and vulnerable communities um, and people who we really can't um, expose to smoke. Okay. Well, I think that will end our general Q&A session, but uh, I'd, let the, I'd like to ask the viewers or let the viewers know that we will uh, stay on for an extra couple minutes here to answer any final questions, if there's any. And I would also like to thank the instructors, Glenn and Amanda. That was an excellent presentation today. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks everyone, it's been great. Appreciate and we will be posting resources uh, on the, uh, the Know Your Forest site and also uh, you can get them through the extension site. Um, I think they're just gonna go up. They may not be there right now, but uh, we have a, a reference list going up there and you know, please get in touch with us you know, to follow up um, through the extension service, through uh, our emails and our extension offices. And we need to be learning together on this, as you can tell, as a West Side Forester, we're really, we're looking at another uh, uh, tree school class webinar about this topic and maybe going deeper and wanting to get input from you and others about, you know, what are the, the, the deeper questions or going a little, um, more into some of the management techniques and maybe some more of the research on this uh, in May, May 18th is the plan. So stay tuned for that. And if we're gonna send you some post webinar surveys to see what else is on your mind to help inform us when we produce that, develop that program. Well, I don't see any other questions rolling in just yet, um, but I would like to thank everyone for tuning in today and listening to our Tree School Online presentation and I'm um, looking forward to seeing everyone at the next one.